Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I want to thank the uh, Advising Summit Planning Committee for hosting such an incredible um, platform for advisors across CUNY to participate in professional development and really sharing of best practices across CUNY. Um, today, we are going to present the new normal, lessons learned through recruitment and onboarding in a virtual environment. I want to take an opportunity to introduce the, uh, my co-presenters. I'll start with myself. My name is Nadine Brown. I serve as the director of ASAP at Bronx Community College. And we have who you heard from shortly ago, Thomasina Brown, Associate Director for Recruitment and Retention, Tika Frazier, Associate Director, Director excuse me, for Freshman Year Programs, as well as our two recruitment coordinators, Carla Ayala and Jacque Wilder. Um, we can move to the next slide. So as we all know, um, the theme of this particular um, conference has been the new normal. So a year, about a year ago, we all had to transition to um, a new normal, which was um, not our usual pace of action. Um, and we essentially had to do this in a very quick period of time. And we also had to be mindful of how we were going to serve our students by providing the same resources, um, engagement, and um, opportunities as we did when we were on campus and in person. Um, so as we made this transition during the summer of 2020 um, and transitioned our students into fall 2020, there was an institutional call to action. Um, and that call to action was in response to an assessment of the student surveys, students expressed concerns, and truly a reflection of the student experience that was um, expressed through uh, student advocates, advisors, faculty, and across our university, or rather college at the time. Um, so some of the problems that really um, kind of surfaced was that, of course, me, like many of our counterpart, our sister colleges, we were experiencing a decline in enrollment and retention. Um, students didn't have an interest per se in um, entering into the unknown as it relates to online learning. Um, we also had a fragmented student experience. Um, there was an inconsistency in terms of access that students had to technology, such as loaner, laptops, software programs for some of our specialized classes, um, financial aid, bursar, and advisement. Um, also something that came up was there was unclear steps for students who were now being um, experiencing for the first time an online formatted class and how they are to be successful in that type of format. Um, so as that time went by, the institution did make an assessment again based on um, express student, ex um, excuse me, express students' concerns as well as um, results that we administered a survey from. Um, so when we came together through a collaboration of freshman year program, um, with other special programs like college discovery, our enrollment management admissions, financial aid bursts aren't such. And what we decided is that we needed to choreograph the student experience. Um, and in doing that, we had to identify intentional touch points and outreach to try to avoid for the level of confusion that students had and try to make sure that we were removing the redundancies and we were closing the knowledge gap and the access gap that our students were experiencing. Um, so we did again this through cross campus collaboration and communication development. Um, many communication plans were developed, timing um, lines were also created. Um, also, we had to streamline our device loaner program in terms of laptops, getting technology into the hands of our students, um, as well as um, creating more access for students to speak and to address things of the nature of financial aid, birth star, and of course, consistent access to advisement. So some of the outcomes that my, my fellow presenters are going to discuss are really um, our goal of having better informed and prepared students. Um, also improving the institutional timely response. Um, we also increased our utilization of technology in terms of Teams, Zoom, some of you guys are aware of some of these uh, technologies, as well as things like SignalVine, which is a two-way texting system, QList, which is a queuing system, Blackboard, and Tutor.com. Um, there was also a development and expanded registration modality. So whereas before students would come in person to get registered, we expanded modalities to include on-demand registration, um, outbound phone calls, um, as well as uh, Zoom in phone calls and by appointment as well. 
Um, and this is all done through either a virtual Zoom room or through um, phone calls through our, our advisors reaching out directly to students. There was also an expansion of virtual front desks. So the financial aid office, admissions, um, and all the departments created opportunities for students to be able to access virtual front desks where they were able to speak directly in a breakout room with professionals that could address whatever their needs might have been. Um, and the last thing I would say is that one of our positive outcomes was the reduction of early signs of academic distress and withdrawal. And again, all of these factors that I provided as an overview will be discussed by my co-presenters. Um, and at this time, I wanna pass the floor over to uh, Jacque and Carla, who will talk to you more about our recruitment efforts. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Carla Yala, and I am one of the recruitment coordinators for the program. And I will be speaking to you about reimagining recruitment, keeping what worked, and adjusting to what didn't work. Um, so like Nadine had mentioned, the big problem was how are we going to transform recruitment and registration to work in a virtual environment versus we were on campus, our students were seeing us face to face. As recruiters, we were able to speak to our students, give them a quick info session. They were able to sit down with an advisor, ask any questions, register for classes. We also had financial aid um, sometimes in our registration. So we kind of have that one-stop shop, making sure our students leave with as much as, as their questions yeah. answered. So now we were struggling with having to make this all into a virtual environment. So the first solution we came up with is using technology. So we use Microsoft Teams. That was very crucial for us to be able to connect with staff, to also be able to connect with other departments. Um, because when we were in campus, sometimes we will walk our students over, oh, here's financial aid, here's admissions. We wanna, we wanna make sure that we're able to assist our students that same way. So um, having Teams allowed us to Hobson's was um, a program that was only utilized by admissions, but we were able to adapt it um, as, as a virtual environment. WebEx and Zoom, as you know, Zoom is a perfect way that our students are able to still see us and we're able to see them also. Google Voice, as you know, a lot of our students don't like picking up phone calls, so we were able to text them. So that allowed us to stay in connection with them, with our group, and also it helped us meet our students where they were at. So one of the challenges that we're still dealing with, right, because we're still living in this virtual world, is remain agile and flexible so we could also assist our students, right, adjusting to the process and discovering things that were not working and, you know, and just be flexible about it. And that gives us an example of when we first started, we wanted to make sure our students still saw us in a way. So we went and we did a couple of videos. Um, showing a quick info session with our faces, presenting ourselves out there. But unfortunately, it did not work. Our students were not looking at the videos. They were skipping through it. So we had to go back to the drawing board and make sure that we're able to tell the students about ASAP. And we did that by allowing the advisors to sit down and talk to them, allowing the advisors to help us out in info session and also register them. And they were also able to commit through advisors. So we were able to do a lot within one meeting. And this just gives us an opportunity, allows us to constantly analyze what work and what does not work, introduce new ideas and new technology. And, you know, we're very grateful that we were able to, to have that opportunity to speak to our supervisors, our directors and our deans and, you know, express ourselves. This didn't work. Um, we saw that this didn't work and it was, it would, it, you know, we weren't feeling comfortable about it. So we were able to sit down, they were able to listen, we were able to go back to the drawing board. And that's still something that we're doing even now. Um, so also this just helps us transition in and I feel like I'm excited to see what is it that what we're using now we're able to take back to the campus when we do go back, right? So that is um, our goal. Go ahead. Thank you, Carla. Uh, so that was great. Hi, everyone. My name is Jaquay Wilder. I am the other recruitment, quarter, recruitment coordinator for the ASAP program at BCC. Um, and so just to expound a bit on what Carla has just mentioned, uh, once we found out that we had to go remote due to the pandemic, um, it was really our focus to just build on what was already working for us um, and also just being open to making changes uh, to what was needed for the recruitment cycle. 
Uh, so when we're on campus, of course, as you guys know, uh, a student can register with an advisor by just coming into the ASF office or making an appointment um, and everything will get done in the office right then and there. So now that we were remote, we really wanted to focus on um, increasing student access for advisor interaction. So the first modality that we utilized for registration and making the um, appointments uh, was Hobson's. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Hobson's, um, but Hobson's allows students to go in and make an appointment. Uh, once they made the appointment, they would get an email um, with the advisor's name, the advisor's Zoom link, um, and the day and time of their appointment. And the day of their appointment, they just log in and register that way. So that was the first mode uh, that we used when we went remote. And then we started to notice that our students needed a more of a high touch support system. They wanted more, um, you know, that face to face interaction. Um, and so again, we wanted to make sure we were increasing student access to advisors. So then we added on a second modality for students to register for classes, and that was called um, advisor phone calls. And so the advisor phone calls um, consisted of advisors reaching out to students that made an appointment on Hobson's, but they were a no show. Um, and so what would happen is on the day of advisor phone calls, we would assign those no-show students to advisors. They would give the student a call and say, hey, you know, we saw that you had an appointment last week. Uh, we noticed that you missed it. Are you ready to register now? Um, and this really helped out students because it allowed them to speak directly with someone. Um, they, you know, they can choose the option of doing a Zoom call or just being on the phone call and allow the students to register with the advisor right then and there. Um, Next, we added on on-demand Zoom sessions. So uh, on-demand Zoom sessions, you can uh, think about that as like a virtual walk-in session. So this was the third modality that we added on for registration. So all students that were eligible for ASAP um, that weren't registered yet, they will receive a link, um, an invitation to our live Zoom sessions. They would get the, uh, the day and the time that we were available. And so the recruitment team, which is myself and Carla, along with about 12 to 15 advisors, we were all on the Zoom meeting and just kind of waiting for students to come on in and register. Um, and we got a great response to this. A lot of students came to these walk-in sessions. Uh, we noticed that students uh, were saying that they had busy schedules and they just couldn't find time to make an appointment to register for classes. So these allowed, this allowed those, those type of students that didn't have that free time to just walk in when they were available. Um, we also had students that didn't even need to register coming on in um, that just had questions about their CUNY FIRST account and they were just looking for that face-to-face -face interaction. So students would come to the Zoom room uh, we will put them in a breakout room with an advisor. They will register for classes, learn about ASAP, fill out a commitment form, and do all of that all in this one Zoom meeting. And so we found these Zoom um, walk-ins to be very efficient because a student was able to get, you know, everything done in that one Zoom meeting. We like to think of it as like a one-stop shop, um, get everything done, and then there was no follow-up for the student. Everything was done there. Um, so students found this to be very helpful, and we got a really good response from students with the walk-ins. And so in addition to increasing the modalities for registration, we also needed to expand our use of technology so that we can recruit and register students more efficiently. So before when we were on campus, we were using a Google Doc to record all um, registration appointment information. So the student's personal information, um, the outcome of the registration appointment, and any notes that the advisor needed to make, this was all recorded on a Google Doc. Uh, when we were remote, we decided to expand our technology and start to use Hobson. So as mentioned, Hobson's was um, used by students or is still is being used by students to make appointments. Um, but now Advisors is a brand new system that they were using. Um, they can use it to record uh, student outcomes after their registration appointment. And so Hobson's was a great tool to use because it allowed the recruitment team to now also go into Hobson's and see you know, if the student is fully registered, um, if the student was referred to another program within BCC, uh, we can also see the date of the registration. We can see any notes that advisor made. Um, and again, this Hobson's tool was able to be used, you know, uh, school-wide. So everyone can see the outcome of that appointment. Um, now we're using QList for registration. So QList is like a system, I want to say like a virtual waiting line. Um, I like to think of it as like when you're at a store and you're waiting in line and you're waiting to see the cashier. So when students use uh, QList, they log in, they put in their first name and their last name and their phone number. And when they choose the ASAP queue um, using that system, um, they're put into a queue chronologically with other students. And the great thing about QList is that students do not have to wait there and wait online. Um, they can go about their day and do other things. And then as they're getting to the top of the queue, uh, QList sends them a notification via text message or email letting them know like, hey, you're getting to the top of the queue. Please be available for an advisor to contact you. Um, so, so far, QList has been good. We just started using QList this week. We've only had a few days of it. Um, so we are still working out the kinks of it, but so far it's been a really good tool um, to use in addition to Hobson's. 
And so after we've been increasing our modalities, um, we've been expanding our technology, we also wanted to just enlarge our team. Um, so of course we have our regular ASAP team and we're, you know, we're great and everything like that, but we can't register students by ourselves, right? We need help from admissions, bursars, to lift holds and different things like that. Um, and so as Carla has mentioned, we wanted to make sure we're utilizing teams to reach out to all of these different departments. Um, now at first, um, I think at first we were using teams to like reach out to specific people in, in the departments, but then a different system was created where we were able to just at the department. So you can go onto teams and just put at registrar or at admissions. And anyone that was available during that time that you needed their help, um, they can respond to notification on Teams and assist you and troubleshoot right then and there. And this allowed for advisors to uh, get students registered within that one hour time frame, especially if someone responds in a timely manner. So Teams has been very helpful. I know everyone's very familiar with it. And another way that we enlarge our team is that we use student leaders, which, you know, um, as student ambassadors. So in person, we use the student ambassadors to help facilitate info sessions in person. Um, they would, you know, uh, facilitate it in a, like a large auditorium. They will also direct students into another room to meet with advisors. And then they would also sit at a computer with the student and help them physically. Um, so we, as, as I mentioned, we wanted to just build on what was already working for us. And so what we did was we incorporated that same exact routine, but just virtually. So student leaders are still helping us um, facilitate info sessions. They are still helping with commitment forms and they even have started doing like call campaigns for different recruitment events that we were doing. Um, and so just to add value to the student leaders experience while they're at ASAP, they're also now um, doing like phone calls to students after they have met with an advisor. And these phone calls are just there to, um, you know, give students that peer support that they may need after they register. So once they register with an advisor, the uh, student leader then calls them and says, hey, you know, how did your appointment go? Do you need any additional help? Uh, were you able to access your BCC email? You know, just to give them some one-on-one -on -one peer support that they may be looking for. And so as you guys can see, you know, we've been very flexible, as Carla mentioned, very agile with how we're registering students. Uh, we're always expanding our modalities and increasing our technology based on, you know, the student ever the recruitment needs. I'm gonna pass the floor to Tika, I believe. I need to unmute. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, and I'm Tika Fraser, the Associate Director of the First Year Program. So at the top of the presentation, Nadine spoke about the disjointed student um, onboarding experience, um, students not being able to connect the various parts of the enrollment process and get their questions answered. So what we did was we pulled together a committee of folks, um, key players on campus from ASAP, first year program, Office of Student Success, admissions to really look at the, um, the communication plan for onboarding students. And what we decided was that we were gonna outline a few front end um, onboarding touch points, as well as ongoing um, onboarding throughout that first semester. The main touch points were, there were five of them, from one from admissions, two from advisors, individual advisors, for third, the advisement department, four, office of student success, and um, five, the peer mentor outreach. Okay, so what happened at the admission um, process? at the admissions. Uh, so once a student was accepted to BCC, the admissions offered opportunities for students to have accepted student sessions to set up expectation of what should be expected throughout the onboarding for students. Um, and as soon as they've met with an advisor and are registered, they also receive specific outline an enrollment checklist, just outlining what the next steps of the process were. So that included the enrollment checklist that spoke about, okay, after this, you will receive um, communication from the advisement department, um, Office of Student Success regarding NSO and um, peer mentor outreach. So we wanted to set the expectations so that students knew what were the next steps in their enrollment process. 
once a student had also met with an advisor, within 24 hours, that advisor was expected to send a text message to that student providing in from all forms of contact. So that means they provided their phone number, their email address, and just welcome them to the institution and saying, hey, if you needed anything, just be in touch with me, okay? The third step of um, touch point was the advising departments. And this was major because um, ASAP has always sent an um, type of outreach to their students about next steps, but the general student population, they never really received that type of communication. And so what we did was that we came together, ASAP and the first year program came together and outlined what those that message would look like to ensure that all students were having a similar experience for um, that welcome from an advising department. So that message included, um, again, next steps and important to do items, uh, information about the new student orientation inviting them to a new student welcome, as well as providing a link to a new student resource page. This new student resource page um, basically um, outlined all the different Q and A type questions that students may have around financial aid and what that resource looked like around meeting with an advisor if they needed to follow up, what were the services available to students because many students, they would have to go and search on the website for everything. So to make it as easy for the student as possible, we created a new student resource page on ePortfolio. On that page, it also had inf um, links to various videos and explainers. And so overall, that provided a, a, a outline of the expectations, outline of the resources, and again, building on whatever the information that admissions had provided regarding the next step. This communication from the advisement department was done via email and text message. First, an email was sent, and then a text message was sent afterwards saying, hey, look out, you know, we sent you an email to you, we sent you an email, check your email for the next the next steps and to do items. And this was all done on Signalvine. The texting was done on Signalvine, which is a texting platform that BCC now, BCC has purchased. Okay, um, after that, then the Office of Student Success will send an, an outreach email to the students through Hobson's actually. So admissions send their communication through Hobson's. Advisement departments send their communication through Qualtrics, through the, ad, the advising department's email, and Office of Student Success send their communication through Hobson's as well. And this NSO outreach really provided um, again, steps, because we find that the students need steps to be broken down into small, understandable and manageable steps where they, where there's no confusion about it and it's as seamless as possible. So Office of Student Success, they provided um, details about how to access the orientation. What we found in the fall semester uh, was that many students did not know how to access the new student orientation on Blackboard. They do not did not know how to um, access their CUNYFIRST or you know Blackboard. So we wanted to be as clear as possible regarding the uh, completing the NSO. So that communication from Office of Student Success provided that, that clarity for students. So there was the email from Hobson's and then there were a series of text messages that were sent to these students as well. A general text message just saying, hey, be sure to complete your um, new student orientation on Blackboard. And then after we started to segment that information and texting students based on where they were. So if a student started the NSO and did not complete, they will get a specific, those students would get a specific nudge. If there were students who did not start or made no action on NSO, we would also um, provide a specific nudge for the, those students as well. 
Um, and a lot of the text, well, of course, the texting is being done on Signal Vine, and we have peer mentors on the back end who are there to troubleshoot and answer any questions that students may have about completing the NSO. The final point of contact was peer mentors. Great segue. Peer mentors played a very, very important role in checking in um, on this process and ensuring that students were smoothly, you know, going through that process of onboarding. So, Peer mentors came from ASAP and the first year program, and they did um, specific phone calls, text message, and emails to the students just to check in to see where they were in terms of the next steps and to do items. So um, they were checking in. Hey, did you get complete NSO? Have you done the Spark? Um, did you register register for a new student welcome? Where are you with your FAFSA and TAP application? Do you have a computer for classes? And we, the peer mentors, recording the responses to these questions and help to connect students with these resources and to assist them in completing their checklist. So that was basically the front end onboarding touch points. Those were the five touch points. Um, next slide, please. So th this onboarding, as I mentioned earlier, complete, continued into the first semester experiences. And what we wanted to do was that we're, we wanted to ensure we were helping students to maintain that connection. So one of the, the, the main way of doing so was trying to get as many students enroll in the, the first year seminar at BCC, which is a two cre one credit, um, two hour course, which is an, basically an extended orientation to college with personal and academic development. We tend to get about 65%. 65 to 70% of our freshman population who enroll in the first year seminar. We have embedded peer mentors. We have faculty um, participate in faculty development and are supporting those students. So in that space, it's easy for those students to maintain contact with a valuable resource. Then we continued with our nudging campaign. This nudging campaign was birthed from the Student Persistence Initiative from CUNY Central. And we literally, this um, year, we were asked to um, institutionalize this and to make it our own. So we took whatever foundation that CUNY SBI had created, which is a Student Persistence Initiative, and we made it our own. We um, we um, basically outline um, various nudges around credit momentum, FAFSA, growth mindset, and important reminders. And in those um, nudges, we have peer men, and these are timely and consistent nudges, just in time information for students to reminding them of an activity, reminding them to complete um, a to-do item, or just providing information that the students may find useful. Then we have the week of welcome, um, which is a cross campus collaboration, basically, where we have volunteers from various departments to answer student questions for the first week of class. And uh, um, so at any point, a student can sit into a Zoom room and get their questions answered by various members of the college community. And finally, we gave the students the opportunity to connect with the larger campus, campus community on a monthly basis through student town halls. And you've got questions, we've got answers types of um, meeting. Um, and these were the town halls are on a monthly, ba monthly basis and the biweekly set and the, the you've got answer, you've got questions, we've got answer sessions were on a biweekly basis and students were actively participating in these various communication um, touch points. So that is what our onboarding process looked like for our students. First, we had the um, front end onboarding and maintaining a first semester experience where students were, you know, continuously in contact with a support with support from the campus community. That's it. Okay. 
So why did we do all of this? Um, and the reason that all of this took place was because we wanted to see a positive impact in our, in our student outcomes. Um, and so um, we started this semester. And um, so we have some preliminary um, results. And as you can see um, from the chart, that students that attended no sort of welcome, no new student orientation and none of the program welcomes, no first year program or ASAP welcome, um, only 33% of those students are on track to have a GPA of 2.0% or higher at the end of the semester. Whereas students that have attended any sort of um, orientation event um, are have 58% of those students are on track to have a GPA of 2.0 or higher at the end of the semester. Um, in addition to um, higher grades, we're also seeing less withdrawals from students. 9% of our students in the fall 20 semester received a WN, which means that they either did not know how to attend class, decided not to attend class, and did not know that they needed to officially withdraw. Whereas um, in the spring 21 semester, after all of the calls and nudges, orientation events that, that um, reinforce the idea that, that you needed to officially withdraw, um, only 5% of our students received a WN. So these are really, really positive changes that we've seen in our students' behavior. Um, anecdotally, professors are noting that students are um, coming to class more. Um, they're being more prepared for class than they have been in previous semesters, and they're engaging more, primarily engaging more than they have um, since the fall 20 semester. So more students are uh, leaving their turning their cameras on, answering questions in class, um, understanding what's expected of them in the virtual environment. And um, even advisors are noting that students are attending their advisement sessions with more consistency um, and really being prepared to, to start classes. Um, and all of that is because the expectations that we have for our students, the things that we want them to accomplish are being made clear at the beginning and at multiple points, not only during um, their, the, the time before classes start, but during their entire first semester so that they know what, to ex what we expect of them and what they should expect of, of themselves. So where do we go from here? The things that we, we want to do is um, we want to work with institutional research and determine um, the real impact of the work that we've done. Has it affected um, final grades? Um, has it affected the need for students to complete um, a uh, satisfactory academic progress appeal. So are more, are more students getting better grades stay, uh, per, and persisting to graduation? We also want to take a look at the data to determine the optimal combination of onboarding activities um, and then work uh, collaboratively amongst our different de departments to figure out exactly what information it is that the students need and how we can best help them to get it, which modalities work well. Um, and so uh, ASAP has done mostly uh, advisor talks to students. FYP has made some really great videos. And this semester, we're planning to incorporate those two things together so that we can see what works for students and um, what works best for students. And then we want to keep reviewing our process and determining the things that students like and taking what works um, that we've created in the virtual environment and translating that to what we need to do for students and how we have to help them prepare when we finally make it back onto campus. So, are there any questions? Um, okay, so um, there's a question in the chat about what types of onboarding and training do we provide our student leaders? So, I, um, go ahead, Nadine. Okay. <laughs> um, you know what, Tika, you go ahead. Take this one. <laughs> go ahead. So, um, 
I'll talk about the um, training for the first year program peer mentors. We are a certified um, peer mentor program by the College Reading and Learning Association. So or the mentors that we had on board were very, very, um, they, they experience peer mentors who've been in FYS 11 and been helping students for a very long time. So we had weekly meetings with those student, those peer mentors outlining what the onboarding process looked like, going over the, the typical questions and answers for those situations. And to be honest, because the peer mentors were so um, experienced, they were the ones who identified what were the gaps in their training and what they needed additional support and help with. But on a regular basis, in terms of our peer mentor program, we're doing weekly meetings and training and one to two day trainings in the summer. And this is all done in teams. And we do have a teams group where peer mentors um, share information with each other and get to ask questions. In addition, we've been working very uh, closely with ASAP on um, topics for presentation and training for our students. So I'll ask Nadine to talk a little bit about that on, from the ASAP end. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, I won't repeat what you shared. Mm -hmm. uh, we're essentially trying to maximize the training um, that mm -hmm. FYP peer mentors receive and allow it to be more consistent as a, or serve as a standard across the institution. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that we've been doing and coordinating is having um, resource departments like mm -hmm. Office of Accessibility um, are formally, um, it's called ARC, which is our uh, department that deals with food instability mm -hmm. and housing instability. And just having our peer mentors engage with those departments so that they can better have, number one, the knowledge and the information and the contact and how to make sure that students get connected. So when we talked about the onboarding process where peer mentors are calling students to follow up on whether they've completed the different checklist items, the idea is that some of those uh, needs students might express in those calls. So our peer mentors are prepared to be able to do early connections to those uh, critical uh, departments that serve as a retention tool in ensuring that our students stay enrolled and stay successful. Okay, so we have another um, question and um, it's, it is, QLIS was mentioned and that it replaced the need for appointments. In what way and how? Um, I, I guess, do you wanna? I, I mean, yeah, uh, um, yeah. So um, we instituted QLIS this semester at the start of our uh, recruitment session. And um, instead of students logging in and making appointments, um, admissions was able to send out a QLIS link with the, the dates and times that our queue would be open. And um, advisors, are, um, students can join the queue and leave their contact information. And then advisors who are scheduled for registration can then just reach out to those students. Um, QLIS also does have a feature um, uh, of flex appointments, which means that uh, a student can log into the can log into the queue and say, "I'd like to be seen um, at four o'clock," and then um, the analytics of, of QList will put the student in the queue um, uh, and analyze uh, when it believes the student will be at the uh, make it so that the student will be at the top of the queue at the time of their appointment. Nadine, did you want to elaborate? I'll just add that QLIS um, is a system that is used by one of our sister colleges at Lehman, for example. Um, it is primarily supposed to be a system that's used for in person. It's supposed to avoid lines being created outside of a department and allowing students the freedom to be on a different part of your campus and be summoned to the front of the line so they know when to start walking back to that respective department when their time is ready. But we've kind of tweaked it and used it in an online formatting as a way to allow students to have more of an on-demand kind of access to various departments. So I just wanted to add that piece. Mm -hmm. um, so someone has asked, how much does student impact factor into the changes and decisions in changes in decision making? I guess I'll answer that. Um, I think it was discussed <laughs> several times that um, this was a, a cross division collaboration. Um, and one of the things we do is I, I, you know, from just being in part of ASAP is that, you know, data drives and informs what we do. So in, in, our, in our particular situation, it was student surveys, right? Uh, we plan to survey students um, about this onboarding process. And we are working with IR to look at um, 
correlations as it relates to the students that uh, receive this treatment of this onboarding process and students may, who, ha who may have not engaged um, to see if what co coordination of combination of activities would be a benefit. And what we will do is essentially, once we understand, for example, one anecdotal thing is NSW, New Student Welcome, a live session right before the semester or into the first couple of weeks of the semester, we have already started making changes to expand that to offer many more sessions in the first few weeks of the semester to capture any of those students who might've enrolled late. So in terms of decision making, I think it's a cross divisional decision making and collaboration. And we're looking at data to inform what things we enhance, expand and um, or make adjustments to. I hope that answered the question. Um, and so we have another question. It's how many advisors, peer mentors were needed during your on demand Zoom sessions? And what was the average of student participation? That's probably you again. Um, um, oh, actually, I would toss the question to Carla or Jacque, right? Because yeah. Yeah. Really calls. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, I'll just expand a little bit. So during the on-demand Zoom sessions, um, how many advisors we needed? So we would have, I want to say, between 12 to 15 advisors. Um, it was always contingent on how many students were invited. So if we know that we invited 300 students, we would make sure to have uh, a large amount of advisors. And if we invited, you know, 50 students, we would have less. Um, so it really depended on um, how many students were invited. And what was the average of student participation? I'm going to assume you mean how many students came in. Um, so that also would vary. Um, you know, some, sometimes some days students, are, you know, we would get an over, overflow and they all want to register that day. And then some days it would be low. Um, so I want to say around average, I want to say we would register between anything between 12 to 25, 30 students um, in one Zoom session. And that's just like an average. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, and so the the Zoom sessions were organized to last um, an hour or, or an hour or two. So we would give a, the students a, a, a hour long window. They could they could log in any time, kind of within that that hour, um, and then um, we would we would then keep the session going um, until the last student was registered. Um, however, that usually lasted, depending upon the advisors, about an two hours approximately. Do we have, we have, um, about, no. we have about five more minutes. Um, so should if anybody has any last questions, we'll welcome them. Okay, so we have another question. How long in advance are students informed about registration? Um, can you clarify? Are you speaking of from time of acceptance or committed to the college? Is, are you talking about the timeline between that and being able to schedule a registration appointment? Okay, yes. <laughs> um, so again, this, this is a handoff. The onboarding process we discussed today is a handoff from admissions to, um, to advisement. So students are, for example, I would say the first few allocations that typically happen in January or February uh, we didn't start up. We started up, for example, this cycle, our registration process on the 12th, which was this week. So for those particular students, they did get a save the date as to when registration is going to open up, but their time to being accepted and ready to enroll to actually registering for an appointment would have probably been a few weeks. However, um, it, this process is done by admissions on a, several times weekly. They are sending out invitations. So as they are committing students and students are enrollment ready, those students will have sometimes a few days between completing that process and getting an email link to schedule for a registration appointment. Right, and so again, as of right now, we're not doing a registration appointments. So these students have gotten links to our QLIS queue. And um, then when the queue opens, like for instance, it opened up at, at 2 p.m. today. Um, so when the, the, the queue opens, students are then able to just join the queue and um, in, input their contact information and have a advisor reach out to them. So today, um, I'm happy to say when the queue opened at two o'clock, we had 41 students waiting online to be served. Yes, and I've been monitoring the queue. So if you saw my eyes moving, I was multitasking. So forgive me. <laughs> Just making sure we have enough advisors ready to serve the students that are there. All right. So I think with three minutes, if, oh, let's see. Okay. I think if there's no other further questions, um, 
Chris, uh, Thomasina, do you want to put up the contact information? So if yeah, I'm putting it up right now in case anybody has any questions or would like to contact us. Um, you can reach us at, um, at uh, email is at asap at bcc.cuny.edu. Um, and then on the, the website, which is bcc.cuny.edu slash ASAP. Thank you guys for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Very informative. Thank you for having us.